I'm so happy to be here this weekend, and I uh, appreciate so much getting to be part of the worship and just the stirring that it does uh, in my own soul. Uh, you know that we're being joined uh, now in worship by all of our uh, campuses, so enthusiastically reviewed on the video that we watched, and, and uh, so welcome to all of them, and, and uh, let me say what I uh, hope uh, through uh, these 25 years almost of preaching is abundantly clear that um, uh, the great uh, joy uh, and delight of my life is uh, the oneness uh, that I share uh, with Kathy, and I hope that that's just sort of leaking out of me uh, in ways I can hardly control. And uh, I think that there, pro I'm sure there isn't a better uh, example of a 5G uh, Christian, a uh, glorifying, growing, grateful, gracious, generous uh, person uh, than Kathy. Uh, Proverbs 31, uh, 10 says, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Happy birthday, Kathy. Amen. Amen. That was, guys, that was a really great time to kind of make eye contact with her and say amen. <laughs> Just like to give you these little tips every so often. Get off it. Okay. Uh, open your Bibles, please. Uh, open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 9. And uh, we're continuing our uh, journey through the gospel of John, authentic Jesus. And uh, this section is called Authentic Revelation, as Christ is unfolding who he is. Uh, John chapter 9 is uh, the story of the man who was born uh, blind, uh, whom Jesus healed. And uh, frequently in Scripture, physical blindness is presented as a picture of spiritual blindness. And while relatively few people are born uh, blind uh, physically, uh, uh, all of us, say all of us, all of us are born uh, blind uh, spiritually. Uh, dead as a doornail. Uh, we uh, cannot uh, see spiritual realities. For example, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 4, uh, describes all of us uh, saying this, that in our case, uh, actually, the God of this world has blinded the minds, say blinded, blinded the minds of unbelievers uh, to keep them from seeing uh, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ uh, who is the image of God. Uh, it's not so much that people uh, can't see it, or, or pardon me, don't see it, or won't see it, uh, it's that they can't see it uh, because they were spirit, they're spiritually blind. Now, how many people can remember a time in your life where uh, you were spiritually blind, where the things of Christ meant nothing to you, the Bible was not a treasure to you? Put up your hand if you were kind of remember a time like that in your life. Well, uh, it's an awesome thing when God breaks through, defeats the enemy, and your eyes are opened uh, to that reality. A lot of times, uh, people are like, I just don't see it. You know, I'm just not seeing it. I, I, I hear you talking about it, but I don't feel it. I, I can't see it. And and uh, that's why this uh, two-part uh, little mini-series here on John 9 has been called uh, How to See God Working. How to See God Working. I mean, that's the greatest thing that can happen to a human being is to see God working. So uh, we're going to finish that up, uh, God willing, right now uh, in John chapter 9. Father, we pray as we head into your word now uh, that you would help this uh, weak uh, man uh, to be strong in the power of your spirit, and we pray that these, uh, which are more than just words on a page, we pray that the word of God uh, would nourish our hearts, and that it would uh, cure our blindness. We would be those whom Jesus uh, touches and whose blindness fades into the glorious light of seeing you working and recognizing who you are. Uh, work uh, that work in all of us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're joined, you know, uh, in worship now by all of our campuses and uh, uh, wherever you are, uh, let's get our eyes together. One church on seven campuses, say one church. I love hearing that, say it. One church and uh, all of our eyes now on God's word. I'm going to review a bit from last week. 
Um, so uh, here it is, John chapter 9, verse 1. As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, congenital blindness. Not, oh, I need glasses. Never saw the light of day, never. A man uh, blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Last time we were together, we uh, used that as a way of uh, saying that that's why some people can't see what God's doing. Jesus uh, saw this man as a person to help, uh, but they saw him as a guy to debate, you know? So, so where, what, what exactly is the problem with this guy? Was he, blind? Was he a sinner? Was his, were his parents sinners? Why is he blind? And, and Jesus, of course, doesn't accept their multiple choice a question and says a neither and so on in verse 3. But I, I just kind of, we talked for a minute about how if you're a narrow thinker, if you're, a, it's either this or this or nothing else. And I kind of talked about if you like to narrow things down to just this or just this. And, and we said this is kind of a, a classic sort of a Christian, narrow-minded um, it's just two things, um, uh, just two important things even, and they are important, and, and, but you get focused on just a couple of things, and you can't see all that God is doing. Sometimes you see the issue, but you don't see the person. Christians are famous for this kind of reductionism. Reductionism is where you make main things only things, where you make big things the only thing. Everybody, uh, God forgive us, everybody say that, say God forgive us. God forgive us for the damage that, that, that Christians do thumping people with the Bible, but they, they might have the letter of the law correct even, but they don't see the people, and as a result, they don't see God working. I got a, another example of this I, I brought this week, and I just, there's a thousand of these I could make up, you know, and then, what are your two things? You know, well, I, I, you know, we're into homeschooling. By the way, homeschooling is a good thing to do. If the Lord leads you to do that, everyone say it's a good thing. I'm not down on that in any way. I'm down on people like, that's the only thing you should, everyone should do this. Really? 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 Do, do you travel at all? It's a big world out there and God's doing a lot of awesome things and it's great that you have those convictions. Well, I think you should never walk past a homeless person. My wife, we go downtown every Friday night and help homeless people. How many people are glad they do that? I'm glad you do that, but there's lots of ways to serve God and uh, I never walk past a homeless person. I always try to help them or do something or have a word or a gift or something, but I don't think you should always do that. And I just look at, look at, get off your narrow thinking that keeps you from seeing all that God's doing. We call that clean your glasses, okay? And Jesus saw the man so much differently than the disciples did. Jesus answered, yes, neither actually. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, verse 3, but that the works of God might be. All in favor of seeing the works of God? All right, clean your glasses. Lose that narrow thinking. We must work the works of him who, Jesus said, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And this was the idea of roll up your sleeves we talked about last time. Involvement opens your eyes. So did, how many of you uh, contacted the church this week? It's like, I got to find a way to serve, man. I've just been a spectator. That's why I'm not seeing God do more. I'm just, I'm just along for the ride. Okay. And Jesus was challenging the disciples, and then he kind of starts to model it himself. He just kind of gets his hands dirty for this blind man. And having said these things, verse 6, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. And all God's people said, yeah. right. Gosh, are you here this morning? Nine o'clock service. Shake it loose, baby. <laughs> he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So we went and washed and came back seeing. Clean your glasses, roll your sleeves, close your mouth. We talked about this prattle blurs vision and they're not going to, the neighbors aren't going to be able to recognize what God's doing because they just want to talk about it. Just talk, 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 talk. Come on. Having said these things, he spat on the ground. He actually took action, but not them. Verse 8, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it's he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash, go to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. It's fairly clear, right? How many people understand what happened? They just want to keep talking about it. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought uh, to the Pharisees the man who had uh, formerly been blind. So uh, they just kept talking, talking. Get this. 
babblers blocking believing. I want you to hear this. Your words can hinder your faith. Stuff comes out of your mouth that makes it hard for you to believe. And not only can your words hinder your faith, your words can hinder the faith of people around you. Watch out for the stuff you're saying that's making it harder for other people to believe. That's what's going on here. You can't see God working. Close your mouth. Running your mouth blurs vision and then open your mind. Avoid paralysis analysis. You know, we're, <laughs> you're so stuck because you're just picking it apart, picking it apart. That's what they're about to do right here. Check it. This is still review from last week. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. And he said to them, all right, I'll go over it again. He put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? And analysis, analysis, analysis. A miracle happened. Analyzing, analyzing. So they said to him again, again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he'd been blind. So now they're like, you never were blind. And the Jews did not believe that he'd been blind and received his sight. And they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this, see, when you don't like the answer you're getting and you have asked several times and you're still not getting the answer you want, ask somebody else. Is this your son who you say, who you say, you say he was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he, how he now sees, we don't know. Uh, that had to hurt, right? Your parents are bailing on you. We don't know how this happened. Actually, they were afraid. You'll see in a second if you weren't here last time. But how he now sees, we don't know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said to him, uh, he is of age, uh, ask him. Now, ready to get into the new content? That's last time. Now, here's the fifth thing. There's six things in total. How to see God working, clean your glasses, roll your sleeves, close your mouth, open your mind. Here it is. Uh, stand on your story. If, if you really want to see God working in your life, and I'm telling you, this is it now. Get on the story of what God has done for you and stand uh, on your story. Notice how he does that here. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, so they already Totally. We'd like to uh, recall to the stand the actual guy. He's like, well, I already told you my story how many times? But here he comes again. And they said to him, give, God, uh, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. That's quite harsh. I mean, what has Jesus done? Healed a bunch of people, fed 5,000, reached out to a woman caught in sin. I mean, it's pretty awesome what he's doing. And they're hating him for it. I just love the idea that Jesus loves sinful people. What a great thing to keep in mind. Jesus loves sinful people. And uh, wherever he would be, he would seek out those who need him most as those most ready to receive him. So, but they're calling him a sinner for it. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25, here comes the blind man. I love this. Here's his story. Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Isn't that amazing? Now, now get this. That's his story. Okay? And uh, if you, I've said this many times. If you don't have a conversion story, uh, you don't have a conversion. All right? You flat out don't have a conversion if you don't have a conversion story. You, you got to have a story. Okay? And, and uh, if you have a story, you need to stand on your story. And I said to Kathy in the service yesterday, and I'd say that to anyone uh, here, um, I said to Kathy, hey, um, are you a mother? She kind of looked at me like, what are you asking crazy questions at church for? I said, no, no, really, are you, are you a mother? Are you sure? And of course, Kathy, there's a picture of uh, Kathy when uh, our youngest, Abby, was born in 1990, and I don't know who those other two goomers are. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, of course, she, she says, of course I, I'm a mother. I said, well, well how did that happen? Uh, no details, please. 
And she said, well, you know, and I, I got pregnant, I went to the hospital, and, and of course, she said, why do I need to go into this? I, this? Of course I know how this happened. No, and I agree. You can't become a mother without knowing it. Every mother has a story. Ladies, true or false? Every mother has a story, and in that story, she's very familiar with the details, she has it all down. Right, you can't uh, uh, enter into a temporal relationship like being a mom without knowing that that happened and how it happened, you have a story. Correct. And you cannot enter into an eternal relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, without knowing it. So those of you who are here at church this weekend and you got some sort of, look, you don't have to know the date and you can forget when your kids were born. You can forget their birthdays. Moms, you really don't, but you can forget their birthdays, I guess. But you can't forget that it happened and how it happened and you know that you know that you know. Moms, am I right? You know. And it's the same way with knowing Jesus. And that's why when they said to this guy, you know, what's going on here exactly? He says, well, I don't know all these. He was, he was very kind of young in his faith. He was just kind of developing. He said, I don't know all you're talking about, about who Jesus is. I, all I know is this. I was blind. Uh, now I see. In fact, this standing on your story is so important. I want to just share four thoughts about standing on your story. Uh, here's the first one. Um, relay your experience. Relay your experience. And, and uh, if you ever wonder why people always seem to cower at bullies, you got to love this passage because this blind now seeing guy is going to stand up to the religious leaders uh, big time. And uh, what's interesting to me is look back at verse 11. I read that a moment ago. Uh, that's where he tells his uh, story in 28 words. He says this, he says, the man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. 28 words. Then they ask him again, he tells his story uh, down in verse 15, he tells it in 12 words. He, they're like, how did it happen again? He put mud on my eyes and I washed and I saved. Then they ask him again, and he's like, I was blind, now I see. <laughs> now, if they asked him again, he would have been like, blind, see. <laughs> and then if they asked him again, he would have been, see. I mean, just, the whole thing was in a free fall, which to me would be like he's getting impatient. How many times are we going to have to go over this? What's he doing? He's standing on his story. Listen, no, look, look at, no one can take that from you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know something happened to you. You know it. And look at, look at, stand on that story. Get on that and stay on that. No matter how much people pressure you, no matter how much you struggle, come back to your story. I gave my life to Christ. I know who he is. I know what he's done for me. See, I really like his word here. He's, he's facing up to these high-powered you know, he was, a, he was a blind beggar. And these are like educated, religious, and, and they're like really getting up in his grill about what happened, what happened, what happened? He's like, I know I was blind. Jesus, now I see. You got to relay your story. My story is uh, I was blessed to have parents that love the Lord. My father's in the service today here celebrating Kathy's birthday. My, I gave my life to Christ February of 1967. I've told my story here before, but I'm happy to relay my story. And while I'm doing it, you think about, about your story, okay? Um, my family went to church on a winter uh, Sunday night, February of 1967, and my pastor preached the gospel. And as a little kid, I was seven years old. I was convicted and, and burdened. And at the end of the service, as we sometimes do here, he gave an invitation, anyone who wants to give their life to Christ, anyone who wants to be forgiven. And how is it that little kid's heart just got convicted? And I, I really wanted to go down front. Our church had a balcony in it. And I was sitting up in the balcony and I, maybe I used that as an excuse. I'm not sure, but I wanted to go down front, but I didn't. And I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you felt in your heart to respond, but I didn't respond. And, and as we were walking out of church, I, I was probably holding my dad's hand and I, I looked up at him and I said, Dad, I said, I want to go down front. And, and uh, you'd have to know what it was to try to raise a kid like me. But he says, no, he says, come on, we're going home. And so, I mean, I'm sure he thought 
you know, I've oh, got to get these kids ready for school tomorrow. And he just thought I wanted to run around the church because a lot of times our family would stay and talk to people and we'd run all over. And he just thought, I, he, of course, that's what he thought. I want to just go run around and play. So he didn't pick up on what the Lord was doing in my heart. How would he have known that? And, and I was just like, I want to go down for it. He says, no, come on, we're going home. So I was kind of ticked about that. I remember in my final display of total depravity, I, I <laughs> there have been a few since, but but uh, he, he, he uh, said, uh, took us home, and I, I, went, I remember going into my bedroom, and I was kind of upset, and I took off the clothes we'd wear to church that I was supposed to hang up, and I, I took them off, and I threw them in the ba- bottom of my closet, and I, I was so upset, and I walked out in the kitchen where my parents were uh, washing and drying the dishes, and I looked up at my mom and dad, and I, and I said, I want to know why you don't want me to be saved. So you can imagine the look on their faces. And my mom turned to me, and I could just see it in their faces. What, what, what? My mom took me by the hand, took me, I remember, into her bedroom. And she had a little red Bible. And she knelt down with me. We're on the same level. And we knelt down by her bed. And she opened up the Bible on the corner of the bed. And she shared with me about Christ's love for me and Christ's death for my sins and the resurrection. And she took my hand, and she prayed with me. And I gave my life to Christ. I can see her hands and that Bible and that place as clear as I'm looking at you right now. And I went through a time in my adolescent years when I certainly tried to get away from the Lord and let go of him, but he never let go of me. Once he got a hold of me later in my teen years, he, he has just kept that hand on. Now look, that's my story. And I'm standing on it. And I know what happened to me. And Kathy, uh, this is a great weekend to celebrate her life. And it was, uh, boy, I guess about 11 years later, she was brought to church on a, on a Sunday night by her father to hear her aunt sing. And she started coming to our youth group. And it was uh, June the 23rd, 1978. I remember the day because one of the high points of my athletic career, uh, actually, uh, we went as a youth group uh, to, that, that's actually me right there, believe it or not. Check that hair. And... Uh, <laughs> We had a softball tournament. I won the MVP at this softball tournament, if I could just keep the focus on myself for another minute or so. <laughs> and and uh, at the end of the, uh, but what I remember about that day is now I'm just kind of kidding about the softball thing, but we, we uh, went as a youth group to a, a thing called a softball marathon with all these churches, and we played in this softball tournament. And of course, what matters to me is not in any way the games, but I wasn't even dating Kathy at this time, but I remember, you know, maybe this many hundreds and hundreds of kids all kind of sitting on the ground as this guy got up and shared Um, the reality of heaven and the reality of hell and how you can, by faith in Jesus, know that you're going this way and not this way, you know, and up, not down. And and, and, uh, I remember he said, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ today and exchange your sin for his forgiveness by faith, I want you to stand right where you are. Of course, I kind of already had my eye on her and she stood up right away. I mean, I remember that, she, that I can see that as clear as, as I'm standing here. I can remember what she was wearing, and she stood up, and she gave her life to Christ. She was 15 years old. Her life's been changed ever since that day. And um, so I, gotta, I guess i got to just ask you this. You know, do you have a story? Do you have a story? And, and uh, I, uh, last night in church, I had... Uh, Bill Schifani come up, one of our elders, and, and he ho- told his story back in 1990. And he and his wife found out the same weekend that they both had cancer. And he was a very religious man. He would go to uh, his church uh, to Mass every day he went for years and years and years. Every day, 6 a.m., he said, but I didn't know Jesus. And this big uh, wave crashed upon our life, my wife and I, and our, our health. And and uh, we, we, I, I went and called a friend of mine. I said, I think you have something I don't have. And, and the guy shared with him how he could know Christ personally. Now, look, look, do you have a story? If you don't have a conversion story, you don't have a conversion, okay? This doesn't happen to you while you're sleeping. It's not contagious in the sense that you can't catch it, okay? And, and I challenge you, uh, if, if, if maybe your story is, is I went to church and, and uh, the pastor was preaching on John 9 and, and he kind of said, if you don't have a story, and, and I, I kind of knew some things about Jesus, but I wasn't entirely sure and it had happened to me in March 2013 and I, I came to church and I just settled the matter once and for all. I took it out of I think so, I hope so, and I gave my life to Christ that Sunday morning at church. Today could be your day. 
and, and uh, you got to be like this guy. And, and, and uh, the strength of being able to say, favorite words for me in that verse, one thing I know. I don't hope, I don't think, I, I know what Christ uh, has done for me. So if you want to see God work and clean your glasses, roll your sleeves, close your mouth, open your mind and stand on your story. Then when people challenge you about it, you can relay your experience. Notice this also in verse 26, refuse to be intimidated. Refuse to be intimidated. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Now, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think I've met you before. I'll use you as an example. If I got to meet you after the service and, and, I, and I, I got up in your face, I was like, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? You know, that to me seems like a pretty intense inquisition, right? You might tend to cower a little bit. And if somebody started saying to you, what did he do to you? What did he do to you? How did he do that? Look in the text. I'm reading both of these perfectly. <laughs> they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he do that? How did he open your eyes? How did he do that? They start pressuring you like that. I mean, and so you got you to gotta see how he refuses to be intimidated. So you guys ask the questions and I'll be like the blind guy. Okay, ready? Um, so work on the first one. What did he do to you? Come on. What did he do to you? And then, how did he do that? All right, give, 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 give me both of them, and then, I'll, and then I'll give you the answer. Go ahead. What did he do? Right. And he answered them, I've already told you, and you would not listen. Don't you love that about the guy? I mean, they tried to get up in his face. He's like, I already told you, and you're not listening. Sweet. Love this guy. Refuses to be intimidated. He said to them, I've already told you, you would not listen. And then talk about, talk about turning the screws. He says, why? Do you want to, why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> Ever, turn to your neighbor and say, bam. <laughs> right? <laughs> He's like, oh, so you want, to, you, want, you want to become a Christian too? Do you want to become his disciples? Which is really interesting because he didn't even know who Jesus was. Sounds like he's kind of joining the team himself, right? And gradually you see the progress. I'll mention that again in a moment. But the main thing here is the parents are freaking. The crowd is trembling. The religious leaders are up in his face. But he refuses to be intimidated. I love that. You know, it's very sad when you see blind people trying to blind believers. When you see blind people trying to blind believers, I told you a little bit about Kathy's story. Uh, actually, um, uh, her uh, father, uh, Kathy, had the most awesome relationship with her dad. And, and uh, all the way through high school, that's a picture of them at Niagara Falls together. And, and her dad was so loving and so kind. And, and, and he brought her to church. And that day at that baseball marathon where she stand up and gave her life to Christ, that changed everything. And her father thought he's losing control of his daughter. And I can't tell you how many times Kathy and I would sit at a Bible study like here. This is an old, old picture of her and I sitting at a Bible study. Can you see it in my eyes? I'm, I'm falling hard here. <laughs> and uh, love those Bible studies. <laughs> and and uh, but but uh, we'd go to the this these Bible studies together and then she would come home and her dad would you got to forget this Jesus stuff. you got to let this go. And, and she'd walk upstairs and cry in her room because she loved her dad, but he hated her faith. And it's, it's such a sad, sad thing when uh, blind people try to blind seeing people. For example, by pressuring uh, your story with unbelief. We had a couple of weeks ago in church, praise God, 186 uh, people profess their faith in Christ. And some of you are in this room right now or at church during this service listening to me right now. And I know this is happening. Some of you are going home and, and, and you're, you're somebody in your family's like, how'd they do that? And, 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 and who did this to you? And, and, and what, we baptized you and you're a little girl and that's not good enough for you. And, 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 and they get up in your face about it. And you need to stand on your story. You need to relay your experience. You need to refuse to be intimidated. It's sad when blind people try to blind seeing people by calling you out. They'll isolate you. Here comes that Bible guy again. Or, or worse, maybe they'll start shunning you and they'll have some, we don't need Jesus guy at the football uh, 
party, you know. We don't, we don't, I don't know what he's going to be saying this time, you know. And, and Anybody know what I'm talking about? And they'll push you and strain you and pressure you. They'll try to silence you. You can't be bringing that up. We don't want to hear any of your stuff. And, and it's real hurtful because people that you love so much. And, and I mean, what's, the, what's more natural than wanting um, other people to have what you have experienced? What's more natural than that? And, and, you know, Kathy and I, we got two down, one to go. We, we want more than anything for our kids to grow up and find a life partner like we have found and, 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 and to follow the Lord like we have found. I mean, it's so natural that when you love people, you want them to experience what you've experienced. But that could be a rocky road. So, uh, look, uh, stand on your story. Relay your experience. Refuse to be intimidated. And then this, it might come down to this. You have to reject rejection. They're going to reject this blind man here. He says, do you also want to become his disciples? Verse 28 says, and they reviled him. The word reviled there means abuse, uh, insult, a strong insult actually, or slander. So they, they, they slandered him. They reviled him. They said, you're his disciple. Check it there. But we are disciples of Moses. So see, isolating, drawing the line. And, and look up here for a sec. I got to tell you about this, a little bit about this Moses thing. It's been coming in, up in the text a lot. When they say Moses, they mean two things. They mean the man Moses, and they mean what Moses wrote. Okay? They, they mean both. Uh, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. It was called the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And when they say we're disciples of Moses, they mean we're followers of those five books, which is kind of sad because... Jesus said to them in John 5, 39, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is these that speak of me. For example, these guys probably had Isaiah 42 memorized, but Isaiah 42 says that the Messiah will open the eyes of the blind. They should have been like, ding, 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 ding. This is the guy. But they were studying a book, but it wasn't penetrating their heart. And so... Um, they searched those books, but the books promised the guy that was standing in front of them, and they couldn't see it because they were, tell me, they're blind. And we're working on blindness uh, in church today, our own blindness. And uh, so uh, Moses, uh, sometimes they're talking about the, the, the scriptures that Moses authored. Sometimes, though, they're talking about the person Moses, and they had so wrongly elevated Moses that Jesus Christ the Messiah comes in, who's God himself in the flesh, and they, they can't, because they have Moses so wrongly elevated. Moses' big three things that they just couldn't get off were, um, Moses is the guy who um, uh, brought them light. The children of Israel were led by a, a pillar of uh, cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night, and Moses had brought that light. And Moses had spoken uh, to a rock and water had come out of it. So Moses was light and Moses was a, a water and uh, Moses was what used to fall down from heaven every day? Manna. So Moses was bread and, and uh, those were his big three things. And along comes Jesus Christ who says, um, I am the light of the world. I am the living water. I am the bread of life. Not I, not I have those things, but I am those things, Jesus was saying. And so, um, you can, it's like, game on, right? And Jesus was challenging their false assumptions. Now, Jesus Christ would challenge some of your false assumptions today. And, and he would challenge your thought, I'm good enough, and I can save myself, and, 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 and I'm not as bad as some people, and I, other people need a savior. I'm, I'm doing fine on my own. And he would come right up into that, and he would challenge those false assumptions in you today. Well, the religious leaders weren't very excited about being challenged. And they reviled him, saying, you're a disciple. You're his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. This is pretty awesome. He's, he's, uh, he's not going to back down. Verse 30, the man answered him. Okay, now some people will say there's no sarcasm in the Bible. All right, so that, that, you can't say that anymore after this next verse. <laughs> we know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. 
You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. That's really fun. You want to do that? You don't know? You don't know? You don't know? Really? Next verse 31. We know that God does not listen to sinners. That's all through the Old Testament. Psalm 66, 18 says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Did you know that? If I look passively or indifferently at sin in my life, God doesn't even hear my prayers. Isaiah 55 says, your sins have separated between you and your God and your iniquities have hidden his face from you so he will not hear. And so when I come to God, as I hope you do every day, I have to first confess my sins to him and just acknowledge, Lord, I failed you and I just ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And of course, he's faithful and just to do that when we come to him. But if I disregard sin in my life, the Lord doesn't hear. And here this blind beggar is teaching theology to the religious leaders. Turn to your neighbor and say, nice. He says, we know God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the beginning of the world, which that uh, phrase literally means since from before creation. There's a new high water mark here. Blind people, never since the beginning of the world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man, congenital blindness, born this way. If this man were not from God, he continues, he could, not, he could do nothing. So he like, he goes right at it. I just love that. And then notice again, uh, their uh, response. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. Again, they're trying to go back to uh, you're blind because of your sin, which is not even true. Uh, by the way, uh, in scripture, sometimes sickness is because of sin. Say sometimes. Sometimes sickness is because of sin. Uh, Miriam got leprosy in Numbers chapter uh, 12. Uh, Miriam got a leprosy because of her rebellion against Moses' authority. And uh, also uh, in John chapter 5, uh, Jesus said to the guy, the paralytic man who was healed, Jesus said, uh, now go uh, uh, and sin no more lest something worse happen to you. Okay. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, uh, people who weren't dealing with their sin were taking the bread and the cup. And, and uh, Paul said, uh, some of you are sick and some of you sleep because you're partaking of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. Not dealing with, it's very serious. Some sickness is because of sin. It wasn't, that wasn't their error. Their error was in saying that all sickness is because of sin. And here they assert it again to this man when they say, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us. Both of those words are emphatic in the original. You, you would teach us. See the high view of themselves. That's a big part of blindness. A high view of myself and a low view of you would teach us, it's awful. They cast him out, ex synagogo. They excommunicated him from the synagogue. Get out and never come back. So he rejected them, but this is important. You need to reject rejection. If someone is putting a message of rejection on you because of your faith in Jesus, you need to reject the rejection. Not them, everyone say not them. You don't reject them, you reject their rejection of you. You have Christ now, you're his blood-bought son or daughter. You don't have to worry about who you are or attach your significance to some human relationship. You just press right past that. It doesn't matter what your husband says about your faith. It doesn't matter what your parents or your, somebody in your past says about your following Jesus. You just reject their rejection and you press right through that and you just keep on loving them. Amen. Just reject that rejection. Stand on your story, relay your experience, refuse to be intimidated, reject their rejection, and then this is the best part, I respond to Jesus. Because, look, sorry, look up here again. The only reason I tell you to look up here, I don't think I'm great to look at, I, I, I get that part, trust me, I know you're all like, Ugh. Okay, but the reason is, is because it's really hard to preach to people looking down at their Bible the whole time. So make a little eye contact, love you, look up here. I know on the other campuses right now, they're like, we don't do that, he can't see nothing. They don't even look up on the other campuses. <laughs> nice try. All right, but for those of you I can see right now, come on. The thing that I wanted to say about this is, is look up here. <laughs> if you're studying this passage, you find yourself kind of thinking, where's Jesus? Where'd he go? I mean, he, he heals this guy. Now they're like raking him. It's like, man, I wish Jesus would come back right now. Awesome, because that's about what's going to happen right now. 
Check this, verse 35, I love this. Um, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. So some of the disciples, hey, remember that blind guy? Which also wasn't a great thing to say to Jesus, do you remember? But <laughs> hey, remember that blind guy? And he's like, yes. They're like, well, now you can't believe what's happened to him since you healed him. So apparently he was told Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And what did he do as soon as he heard? Found him. Oh, come on, we're going to go help him. Come on, come on, let's, let's, let's get over there. Don't you love that? When you're in a tough spot, when you're feeling the heat from following Jesus, he's like, come on, let's go help them. When Jesus heard they cast him out, and having found him, he said... This is a great little, no, when I, this is the first time I ever really, this week when I was preparing this message was the first time it ever occurred to me that um, the guy had never seen Jesus. If you go back to the beginning, he, he had never seen anything and, and Jesus smeared the mud on his eyes, said, go wash. He went and washed and it says in verse uh, seven, so he went and washed and came back seeing. But he went to his neighbors and he went to his house. He, he, he had never seen Jesus. Awesome, right? So check this. Jesus found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? So I'm wondering, was the blind guy sensing? You know, was he kind of sensing that this was Jesus? Uh, was he um, suspecting uh, that this could be? The sa- so Jesus says to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, this is great. And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? (gasps) He's right there. He's right there. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Up until about a half an hour ago, I had never seen anything ever. Could you sort of point me in the right direction? Um, answer, yes, I can. Check this. Who is he that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you've seen him, and it is he that is speaking to you. (gasps) He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, so, so you've got to pick up um, the flow here. In verse 11, he called him. They're like, who did that? And he said, the man named Jesus. And then a few verses later, well, who is he? And he's like, well, he's a prophet. Verse 33, he called him a man from God. And now he says, Lord, I believe and work. That's his story. That's his moment. He knew that Christ had affected him, but he'd never given his life to him. And how many people in church this weekend are like that blind guy? He's touched me, he's impacted me, but have you bowed before him? Have you submitted your life? This is when the guy gets saved, right here, right? Lord, I believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is his moment. This is, this is the culminate, and it's awesome to me, by the way, to see how it happened. Some of you have been coming to church for weeks or months, or some of you years. I can think of one man, particularly in our church, who came here for 10 years before he confessed Christ and came forward to be baptized. And, and, and it, it takes time for people to kind of see it and get it. And this guy's like, he's a prophet, he's a man of God, he... he, he Lord, I believe, and, and we need to give people the time to come along and get it. And, and some of you don't fully get it yet, but you're coming. Come on. A little bit at a time. Today could be another kind of step forward for you uh, in that. Praise God for this man. And then here's the last part. God's working so powerfully here. Clean your glasses, roll your sleeves, close your mouth, open your eyes, stand on your story. And here's the last thing. Humble your heart. Humble your heart. Just be willing to say, I need help to see it. That, that last, Lord I, Lord, I believe. I, need, I, I think, is it you? And, and, and it's so awesome. Notice this last part, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. 
And having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered and who is he, sir, that I may believe? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking with you. He said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him. Jesus said, verse 39, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Look, that's not a riddle. That's not a riddle. You have to be willing to say, I don't see, I'm blind. Jesus said, I came into the world for the people who are like, I I don't see. It's not clear to me. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're like, we see everything. We see everything. And that's apparent, of course, by their response. I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind, confirmed in their condition. Verse 40, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Oh, you're calling us blind now too, huh? Oh yeah, we're just as blind as this guy was, your little fake miracle. Are we also blind? That's um, not good news for them. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you'd have no guilt. In other words, if you recognized your blindness, I could forgive you and your guilt would be taken away. But now you say we see. You won't admit your blindness so your guilt remains. I can't forgive you. It has to start with you've got to accept your condition. We've talked about this uh, a lot of times here at Harvest. Professing my story, you have to accept the fact I'm blind, I'm guilty, I need a savior, I need forgiveness. Then you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to believe that he died to pay the penalty for your sin. You have to believe that God rose, raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So it's as simple as ABC, but it's not easy. Accept, I'm blind, I'm guilty. Believe in the death and resurrection of Christ and confess Jesus Christ. That's the story. Has that happened to you? The details can change, but the facts have to remain the same. And then the proof of your story, that's how it happens. And then here's the evidence that it's happened. Your faith continues. We're gonna look at that, ne- we're gonna look at that next week. Abiding faith. And then abiding faith produces biblical fruit. The fruit of the spirit, the fruit of worship. By their fruits you'll know them, Jesus said. Abiding faith produces biblical fruit, which amounts to a changed life. This is how it happens. This is how you know it happened to you. This is the professing of faith in Christ, and this is the living it out as evidence that it's really happened to you. So, has it happened to you? Let's bow in prayer together. Father, Father, thank you. Thank you for this awesome, awesome miracle. And Lord, I just wanna pray right now for someone on any one of our campuses. While many have heard this and have returned again, as I relate my story and Kathy's story and Billy's story, many have returned and said, I have a story, I need to stand on my story. But Father, I know it's true that some would say, I don't have a conversion story. Just, I don't, or I'm not sure. And I pray in the powerful, saving name of Jesus that this would be a weekend where some would have their saving story begin. I was going to church and going to church and going to church, but I didn't know Jesus. Or I never darkened the door of a church, but I got to a place in my life where I knew I needed something I didn't have found this church or someone brought me to this place and I acknowledged myself as a sinner do that now just say God I'm a sinner that needs forgiving I've done things I regret I've done things I know are wrong and I can't erase them or earn them away and so I acknowledge my need for a savior a forgiver Just tell God that. 
and say, I believe that Jesus died to pay the penalty for my sin, to open my eyes And I believe in him. I believe that he is the savior that offers forgiveness. And I know I need it. And I confess him today as my savior, as my Lord. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and heal this dark heart. Open these blind eyes. This is my story. Today, I turn from my sin and embrace Christ by faith for my forgiveness. Today, I confess Christ as my Lord. And just say, Amen.